Okay. Let's talk about robots. Um, I've had the uh, very interesting good fortune over the last 10 years to get to build uh, robots that interact with people. And if you know anything about the history of robotics, you know, there's a lot of hype in the 1950s about uh, robots, anime robots, and, and where robots are going to go. For the last 50 years, we've had robots in factories building cars behind cages. And today, only over the last about 10 or 12 years, you start to see robots around people working side by side and doing delivery. So I want to talk about the human side of robots and robots around people. Um, they asked me to say a little bit about how I got here. And, and since this is a conference about startups and innovation, I thought I would say something about, um, about my background. Um, how many people have heard of Xerox PARC? Some, a few people. This is where the PC was originally invented way back in the 1970s. And I had the opportunity to work there for about seven years after I left Stanford. And the interesting thing about um, Park was that it was all about innovation, but in a complete corporate bubble. So it was a research environment where the whole goal was to do really cool stuff, but there was a disconnect from the research to the real world. Um, Willow Garage was a company that I was in, fortunate enough to found, which was a robotics think tank. And Willow Garage was a, was a very interesting, I'll show you a robot from there called the PR2, that um, was a chance for us to, to go out and think about how can we make robots around people, how can we change the world of robots, and, and recognizing that that was the time to do it. And then Savio, my current company, is a startup a clean startup from about um, three and a half years ago. And what's unique about, for me about Savio, this is the first time in my life I did a real startup. And I've been in Silicon Valley for 25 years. Um, and I've been missing it. Everybody around me is doing startups all the time. Um, and it's really a great adventure, and I recommend it to everybody. So I want to start by giving you a little bit of motivation. I want to talk about something called Robots for Humanity. Um, this robot that you see in this picture is a, a PR2 robot. It's sort of humanoid, um, but a little bit more industrial. It's a mobile base. It's got two arms and a head that can move around like this. And there was a play a video. Ah, this is a, a man named Henry Evans who saw the PR2 robot on CNN. We, we built the PR2 at Willow Garage. And, and Henry saw the robot and he said, that robot could be my external body. You see, Henry can't move his arms or his legs, and he can't um, speak, but he can move his head around, so he can type with an on-screen keyboard. And when he saw that PR2 robot, um, of which there were about 50 made, um, when he saw one of the early ones, he said, can I try to use that robot? This was the, the clip on CNN. And so we brought Henry into the lab, and we said, um, Sure, you can try to use this robot. We had the robot sitting at one side, and we had Henry sitting here in his wheelchair. And Henry reached over, and he, he told the robot to turn it to him, reach its arm out to his head. And we thought, what is he doing? What's he, why is he trying to you know, bring this robot to himself? Well, he got the hand here, and he reached out and scratched his own itch. And it was the first time in 10 years he'd been able to do that for himself. And so. This is a, a big aha moment for me, right? It's not that robots are out there just trying to take over all of our jobs, and there's a lot of um, talk about that. One of the things that, that became clear from this is that when you create robots that help people do things for themselves or help them do their own jobs, that that's a big deal, a big opportunity in terms of personal dignity, in terms of how um, Henry can, can live on his own and how he can be more of a contributing member to society. And there's a lot of people who either permanently or temporarily have disabilities. Imagine if you break your knee and you're stuck or um, you know, you're, you're sick for a little while. If we have the ability to care for ourselves, it gives us a lot more power in the world. So this is Henry remotely operating the robot um, from another room. And we've done a lot of experiments um, with having him be able to control this robot and other robots. Um, and this is a collaboration that we did with Georgia Tech and um, the Healthcare Robotics Laboratory. So um, 
I, I use that as a, as a way to kind of set the context, right? Robots are not just industrial. They're not just welding machines. Um, and, they are and they are something that can be around us now for the future. So about three and a half years ago, we founded Savvy Oak. And Savvy Oak, um, you know, it looks like karaoke, but it's pronounced Savvy Oak. Um, and we created it to um, build robots to help people. But we started with something very simple. We knew that you could make robots. We knew that robots could perceive the world in real time. And this is actually the key uh, technical breakthrough that happened over the last, say, 10 years that allows us to have robots around us. And that's that they can perceive the world and compute fast enough to sort of look at all that sensor data and make a decision, should I go or should I turn or should I stop in real time? If you can't make that decision in real time, you say, when you analyze your logs, oh, back there I hit a kid. Well, th that's not OK, right? You have to make the decision first. Um, and so with this change, with this ability to do computation fast, we said, OK, how can these robots change the world for the better? And we created Savvy Oak to go do that. So I want to introduce you to Relay. And Relay is a uh, delivery robot that moves around human spaces. We originally deployed it in hotels. And the mechanism for Relay, oh, here he's coming. Um, so Relay is coming completely autonomously now. And we've got a, a number of them deployed in hotels around the world. What Relay does is basically drives to a location, typically a guest room door, and brings something to the guest. So here we've asked Relay to, um, to drive out here and, and, and interact with you. When it gets to the guest room door, it opens up, and I can get a bottle of water or whatever is sent. You can see uh, there's actually a very deep bin here, and you'll see some examples in a minute. Um, so I can interact with Relay. And when, the, when Relay comes to a guest door in a hotel, the human interaction is really interesting. How uh, I'll try to uh, simulate being this woman, but uh, I obviously don't look like that. Um, when the robot comes to your door, chances are you've never used a robot before. So how do you work it? How do you figure out what to do? And the answer is the robot has sensors. It can see in front of it. And in a hotel, we observe that all the doors are locked. And so we send Relay with a locked bin. It only opens its bin when it sees the door open. So we use the sensors and the fact that it can perceive its environment to make it very easy to use. When it arrives at the door, it opens like this. Um, I say all set. And in the old days, what we used to do is um, simply after the person got their delivery, got their water bottle, it would just go away. And people got really disappointed. So one of the things we learned is people want more time with the robot. Here we ask, um, how is your stay? And if you give it five stars, it's very happy. It does a little happy dance. It says, wee, and dances around a little bit. Um, and says, can I get you anything else? I'll say no. And all the time delay here, again, the robot could have left a long time ago. All this time is for the hotel guests to kind of experience this new technology and maybe take a selfie. Um, and now it'll go back over there and park for the, for the rest of the talk. So here's just an example of what's going on in the hotel situation. The front desk staff gets a call, is asked to send something, and puts it inside the robot and just tells it to go. And then the robot is completely autonomous, navigating near the elevators. When it gets near the elevator, it calls the elevator and then gets inside and rides up. Um, and then when it gets to the guest room floor, it navigates to the door uh, outside the guest room. And it'll avoid things like carts. One of the challenges we had was handling the fact that sometimes the corridors get very narrow. Um, when the robot arrives, it calls the room. And uh, this is uh, actually very typical. A kid gets excited that the robot's coming and uh, you know, grabs all the snacks and stuff that were ordered. And then the mom's left to pick up the pieces and interact with it. And then the robot goes back to its dock and docks and takes care of itself. One of the key things here is that we're adding uh, essentially a new staff member to the hotel. And so one of the questions is, how does, does, it, does it take care of itself? And what does the staff think about it? And the answer to those questions are yes. Once it finishes interacting with the guest, it goes back to its charging dock and waits for the next delivery. And 
when it comes to uh, um, the guests, what do guests think and what do the staff think, you can see um, from the videos and actually if you look online, you can see comments of hotels that have it. People really get into robots. They really like the fact that, um, and it's, there's a novelty aspect, but there's another thing. Think about the last time you got a, a delivery to your hotel room. If you call the front desk and ask, can you send me towels or a toothbrush or send up some coffee or whatever you're asking for, how long does it usually take? Um, what we found is typically somewhere between 20 and 40 minutes is a typical hotel to get a response to your, your request. Relay takes about five minutes. So it's a five times faster than a typical hotel delivery. And that means that the experience is dramatically changed. It's the difference between download this paper from an FTP server or, or you know, somehow order something uh, that's going to come in a week versus you know, a, a modern delivery where you say, you know, I'd like to order something on Amazon and it comes tomorrow. The difference between coming in a week and coming tomorrow is very big in terms of how people perceive the service and use it. Um, the other thing about it is when, when a robot comes to your door, it's not um, asking you for a tip. <laughs> it's not asking you, um, it doesn't judge what you're wearing. So you don't have to get dressed because you're asking the robot to come. It's coming to your door. It's just uh, innocent and, and non-threatening and cute. So w we've actually surveyed the staff and the guests and, and found out that they're very excited about it. Um, one of the interesting questions about the design of the robot, how do you make it cute, is what's the size of it? And people, I said, well, can you make it bigger? Can you make it carry larger loads? You can make it bigger, but then, of course, the whole thing has to get bigger. And there's something about, it's a particular footprint of this robot. We designed it to be a first foray into a human environment. So it has to be non-threatening, about the right size. And so the footprint of the robot is about the footprint of a person. It's not bigger, doesn't take up more space than you do. Um, it's short, partly because if you make it taller, it might fall over, <laughs> and partly because if you make it taller, it will actually threaten people who are shorter than it. So this robot is you know, about this tall. There's very few people who are shorter than it, and so it's non-threatening. Um, and of course, now we've developed this technology that can go from point A to point B in a human environment safely and reliably. So what do you do with it? W we'll continue to put it into hotels because guest room delivery is a use case that works. But what we found is um, apartment buildings, luxury apartment buildings, is a market that looks very much like hotels. The buildings look very much like hotels, except that the delivery case is a little bit different. Usually it's um, you know food being delivered, uh, uh, dinner being delivered, or or package delivery, and so Relay can do that. And then what we found was, oh, if you're looking at human spaces, where does stuff move? And in logistics, there's people who are repairing things, and so in the bottom video there, you see um, uh, pieces being repaired, and all the intra-logistics within a facility can basically be automated without having to do what we did in the old days, which was create a assembly line, or other fixed, um, fixed format and, and very hard to change infrastructure. Relay can basically look at you know, the world as it is and navigate. Just like here, you know, this is not a, we didn't design it for the stage. We just map the stage and then, the robot, and then Relay can navigate on this stage wherever it wants to go. Um, after this, um, there's a couple out in the, in the open area here in one of the booths that our partners recruit and um, NEC, NESIC, are, are hosting, and those two robots are navigating around the floor, and you can see them interact with people and interact with them yourselves. So um, bottom line about Relay is that it is a, it's a technology that I think is the beginning of a wave of technologies. You're going to see a lot of robots interacting with people, but the, the requirements are really different than those industrial robots. So if I go back to, um, to just thinking about the, the old robots versus the new robots, Robots in factories are typically bolted to the floor and they're dangerous and you can't go near them. Modern robots are flexible and just like the world is changing outside, just like you're seeing self-driving cars, just like you're seeing um, uh, robots, uh, industrial robots that are okay to be next to, now you're suddenly gonna see robots that move around our environments, 
and take on the low-value tasks. When you think about um, you know, what do robots do, robots do the things and robots should do the things that we as humans don't want to do. They do the things that um, are the, the simplest things in a job. And the more interesting parts, the more valuable parts of a job, those are the parts that we're going to keep on doing because um, repetitive tasks are not really the best suited for humans. But creative tasks and interactive tasks are things that humans should do. So um, I guess we're not set up to do questions, but I will, uh, I'm going to cede my time to the audience. And uh, I will be over in the booth over there if anybody uh, is interested in, in directly interacting. So thank you very much.